Thank you very much. Good afternoon and thank you all for being here. I want to start by thanking Associate Attorney General Jesse Panuccio. Where did Jesse go? He's behind me, uh, backing me up. Our acting DEA Administrator, Rob Patterson, uh, who is doing a great job for us. Our State Attorneys General, who have joined us here today, Patrick Marcy of West Virginia, uh, Brad Schimmel of Wisconsin, Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania, Ken Paxton of Texas, Leslie Rutledge of Arkansas, and my old friend Mike DeWine of Ohio. We sat by one another on the Judiciary Committee more than a few years, um, causing trouble occasionally. Each of them has made combating opioid abuse a priority and has shown outstanding leadership. Uh, Kellyanne uh, Conway, I saw her come in. She's a coordinator with, for the President in the White House on these issues. She brings a real force and strength and excitement to this effort. And Kellyanne, we're really glad you could come by. Actually, she comes to all of our events. She cares about this, she knows this issue, and is contributing significantly. Um, our nation is facing the deadliest drug epidemic in our history. And make no mistake, what we're talking about today is not business as usual. It is the resolute policy of this administration and this Department of Justice to reduce these overdose deaths, to reduce addiction, and to reduce the amount of prescription opioids that are afoot in our country today. In 2016, an estimated 64,000 Americans lost their lives to drug overdoses. That is the highest ever recorded in our history, actually nothing close to it. Uh, except the previous year when it was 52,000. That was by far the highest we'd ever seen before. And it follows uh, uh, records uh, over several years. Preliminary data suggests that 2017 was worse, maybe not quite so large an increase, but another increase again in 2017. The vast majority of these deaths are the results of opioids, prescription painkillers, heroin, and deadly new synthetic drugs like fentanyl. In the United States, I recently read that we consume the vast majority of the world's hydrocodone and more than 80% of its oxycodone. It is estimated that we use many times more opioids than is medically necessary for a population our size. Millions of Americans are living with addiction. A recent study found that the opioid crisis has cost the United States $1 trillion since 2001. Last year alone, they estimate it cost us $115 billion. The study estimates that over the next three years, uh, uh, this crisis will cost another half trillion dollars. President Trump has made ending this crisis a priority for his administration, and he has taken action from the beginning of his administration. Under his strong leadership, the Department of Justice has taken historic new actions to reverse the rising tide of addiction and death. In July, we brought charges against more than 120 defendants, including a number of doctors, for crimes related to prescribing or distributing opioids and other narcotics. Last week, a week later, I announced the seizure of the Alpha Bay, the largest criminal uh, dark net marketplace in history. This site hosted 220,000 listings, including more than 100 vi uh, vendors advertising fentanyl. In other words, you go on the site and you can, they list the illegal drugs that you can purchase. And it was responsible for countless uh, this fentanyl uh, items, uh, uh, drugs for opioid overdoses, including the tragic death of a 13-year-old in Utah who received drugs that had been ordered off this dark web uh, and we, by an older teenager who gave it to a 13-year-old who uh, lost their life. 
in August, I created the Opioid Fraud and Abuse Detection Unit, a new data analytics program to help find evidence of overprescribing and opioid-related health care fraud. I then assigned 12 experienced assistant United States attorneys to opioid hotspots to focus solely on investigating and prosecuting opioid-related health care fraud. Uh, by November, they'd already begun to issue indictments. In October, the department announced the first ever indictments of Chinese nationals and their North American-based traffickers and distributors for separate conspiracies to distribute fentanyl and other opioids in the United States. In October, the DEA announced the establishment of six new enforcement teams uh, focused on combating the flow of heroin and illicit fentanyl into the United States. These enforcement teams are based in communities facing some of the most significant challenges with heroin and fentanyl. In 2017, the DEA held two of its national prescription drug take back days when people can dispose of unnecessary and potentially dangerous drugs that they have in their homes. In total, the DEA took back more than 900 tons uh, of drugs from our American communities. In November, I ordered each of our 94 United States attorneys throughout the country uh, to designate an opioid coordinator within their office someone to customize our anti-opioid strategy in each one of these districts. Last month, I announced a new resource to target traffickers uh, in, uh, by our FBI, uh, they, uh, for the traffickers who sell drugs online through the dark net and other ways. We call it J-Code, the Joint Criminal Opioid Dark Net Enforcement Team. The J-Code team will coordinate efforts across the FBI's offices all around the world, bringing together DEA, our Safe Street Task Forces, Drug Trafficking Task Forces, Healthcare Fraud Special Agents, and other assets, effectively doubling the FBI's investment on the online drug trafficking. Also last month, I announced a 45-day surge of DEA Special a uh, Agents Diversion investigation, investigators and intelligence research specialists to focus on pharmacies and prescribers who are dispensing unusual or disproportionate amounts of drugs. Rob, thank you for your effective leadership in that. Earlier this month, the DEA placed all fentanyl analogs not already regulated by the Controlled Substances Act into Schedule 1 the category for substances with no medical use for at least two years. This makes it harder for people to acquire illicit fentanyl and easier for law enforcement to investigate and prosecute drug traffickers. Today, I'm announcing our next steps. First, the department has hired an experienced federal prosecutor to lead our anti-opioid effort, efforts, uh, Mary Daly. Mary, are you up here? Right here. Uh, Mary previously served as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of New York and in the Eastern District of Virginia, where she supervised the narcotics unit and was the opioid coordinator. Over her 13 years as a federal prosecutor, Mary has focused on the prosecution of transnational drug trafficking organizations. Mary will serve as director of our opioid enforcement and prevention efforts. She will help us formulate and implement initiatives, policies, federal grants, and programs related to opioids and coordinate these efforts with law enforcement. Second, we are attacking this crisis at its root, the diversion and overprescription of opioid painkillers. Today, I'm announcing the Prescription Interdiction and Litigation Unit, PIL, as we call it, Task Force. The PIL Task Force will focus in particular on targeting opioid manufacturers and distributors who have contributed to this epidemic. We will use criminal penalties. We will use civil penalties. We will use whatever laws and, and tools we have to hold people accountable if they break our laws. 
The task force will work, work closely with the Department of Health and Human Services and will coordinate with law enforcement at all levels. The task force will examine potential legislative and regulatory changes in existing laws. I'm also ordering the task force to examine existing state and local government lawsuits against opioid manufacturers to determine where we can be of assistance. Uh, Mike DeWine and I have worked on this uh, and talked about this before. And in fact, we've all, we're already getting involved in these cases. I am announcing today that the department will file a statement of interest in a lawsuit against a number of opioid manufacturers and distributors for allegedly using false, deceptive, and unfair marketing of opioid drugs. The federal government has borne substantial cost as a result of this crisis. The Medicare Prescription Drug Program, for example, paid out more than $4 billion for opioids in 2016 alone. The hard-working taxpayers of this country deserve to be compensated by any whose illegal activity contributed to these costs. And we will go to court to ensure the American people receive the compensation they deserve. So these, not, these are not our last steps. We will continue to attack the opioid crisis from every angle. We will continue to work tirelessly to bring down the number of opioid prescriptions. We think there are just too many. Reduce the number of fatal overdoses and protect the American people. Those are resolute goals of this department. They're part of the president's direction to us. We intend to fulfill that. We embrace the goals the president has given us, and we intend to be successful. And I have to say, we all need to recognize that 85% of law enforcement in America are our state and local officers throughout this country. They are out there every day on the front lines. We are working with them. We will support them to make their efforts even more successful. And I particularly thank our uh, attorneys general for be being with us today. Thank you. Mr. Attorney General, thank you very, very much. Uh, this is great news. Um, thank you for your commitment uh, to helping us deal with this problem. Uh, this opiate epidemic uh, is having a great toll in the state of Ohio. We're losing about 15 people every single day. Uh, our children's services are overflowing with kids because half of our children in foster care are there because one or both parents are drug addicts. And I could, I could go on and on. But thank you for specifically for two things. Uh, one, for understanding what has happened in regard to fentanyl. Uh, these have, this epidemic has started with the pain meds, it's moved to the heroin, now we're into the fentanyl. And at least in Ohio, it is the fentanyl that is keeping the, the deaths up. Uh, we are seeing some great work at the, at the local level in conjunction, frankly, with the DEA, in conjunction with the FBI, um, and we're making progress. But the fact that fentanyl is so lethal so deadly and it's being mixed into cocaine, it's being mixed into heroin, and the users have frankly no idea, you know, the quantity that they are taking, and that's why our deaths are so far up. So thank you for the focus on that. Thank you. Thank you for your understanding uh, of the origins of this problem, and thank you for your administration's focus in regard to the, the manufacturers of these drugs. Um, we now have 14 states that have filed lawsuits against the drug manufacturers. And the fact that you would file as party of interest uh, is frankly, I think, a game changer and is very, very significant. Um, the facts are that about 20 years ago, drug manufacturers decided that they wanted a much bigger market. And they went to the primary care physicians spent hundreds of millions of dollars in advertising and focus on them to convince them that these were wonder drugs and told them at the time that these drugs were, quote, not very addictive. Um, we know they're very addictive, and yet these drug companies continued, continued to do this. So I, I appreciate uh, what you're doing today. Uh, the sequence has been pretty simple. Uh, people get addicted to the pain meds. They move from there uh, because of price sometimes and availability uh, to heroin. 
and from heroin to fentanyl and then to carfentanyl and, and other things. Uh, the experts tell us that 80% of the people who are addicted to opiates today uh, started with pain meds. And that's why your, your uh, action today, frankly, uh, it makes us very happy. Uh, and it's a real realization of, of what has been going on. So we thank you. We thank President Trump for your focus on this huge, huge problem. Uh, it's my opportunity now to ask Pennsylvania Attorney General Shapiro uh, to come to the podium. Good afternoon. I'm Pennsylvania Attorney General Josh Shapiro, and um, let me thank my colleagues for being here today. And most especially General Sessions uh, for his leadership and for inviting the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to be represented here today. In Pennsylvania, the number one accidental killer is heroin and opioids. Much like in Ohio, it claims the lives of 15 Pennsylvanians each and every day. In our 67 counties, no one is immune. Black, white, brown, rich, poor, male, female. Every single Pennsylvanian has been touched by this crisis, by this epidemic. It is the number one public safety concern of ours, and indeed it is the number one public health concern as well. I fundamentally believe and that we need a multidisciplinary approach to dealing with this epidemic. We have to make sure that we get the dealers off our streets first and foremost in Pennsylvania. My office has arrested five drug dealers a day every single day I've been in office, and I've been in office for 13 months, and I appreciate the Attorney General's focus on dealing with these illegal crimes and our illegal drugs in our communities. But in addition to that, we recognize, as the Attorney General spoke about earlier, the importance of focusing on diversion, and in my time in office, we've increased our diversion arrest. That's a a doctor, nurse, a healthcare provider diverting a legal prescription drug for illegal use, we've increased diversion arrest by 72 percent uh, in my time in office. But we also recognize that collaboration is key. Through our state and local drug task forces, we've made 7,000 arrests in 2017. We've partnered with other attorneys general, like in New York and West Virginia, to deal with the flow of illegal drugs throughout our communities. And we've had tremendous success working with our great partners at the Department of Justice, at the FBI, the DEA, and others, and in particular, the three U.S. attorneys in Pennsylvania. That's why I'm here today, because I fundamentally believe that collaboration is key. The states need more resources, and the Department of Justice has stepped up to provide that and is stepping up even more so with the announcements today. But with all those success, I believe fundamentally we cannot arrest our way out of this crisis. And that as we're doing this work, we have to focus on the supply chain. Well, when four out of every five heroin users start with a legal prescription drug, then the supply chain runs directly to these opioid manufacturers, runs directly to the opioid distributors, which is why we're proud in Pennsylvania to be one of a handful of states leading a coalition of 41 state attorneys general, bipartisan effort, to make sure that we investigate the manufacturers and the distributors for their role in fueling this crisis. I believe that these opioid painkillers have been the jet fuel to this crisis, and we have got to step up together in order to best address that. I also believe that addiction is a disease, not a crime, which is why we have to work together to make sure that those who have accepted personal responsibilities have avenues to treatment. I was proud to partner with Attorney General DeWine from Ohio. We worked together with 39 of our attorneys general to call on the Congress and call on this administration to do away with something called the IMD exclusion, something the President and the Attorney General have voiced support for. Doing away with that will open up treatment beds in every state in this union, and it's critically important that we do that for those who are in need and those who are desiring uh, that kind of treatment. Look, my top priority day in and day out, my number one priority in Pennsylvania is dealing with this heroin and opioid crisis that we face. I'm always proud to partner with whomever wants to work with us to deal with this. My colleagues and, of course, the Department of Justice and General Sessions. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here today 
uh, to support this important initiative. Ah, excuse me. It is now my pleasure uh, and privilege to be able to introduce my colleague uh, from West Virginia, General Morrissey. General, thank you very much. And I also want to start out and commend Attorney General Sessions for his leadership in this area. As many people know, West Virginia has been particularly hard hit by the senseless death that we're seeing uh, the, across our country. And we've been proud to work with this Attorney General as he is tightening up enforcement up and down the pharmaceutical supply chain. Over the last number of years, West Virginia has taken a number of important steps to go after this epidemic and tackle it holistically from a supply, a demand, and an educational perspective. That type of approach is going to be needed. But what we're talking about here today is especially critical. Because right now, the pharmaceutical supply channel system is fundamentally flawed and needs to be changed. There are too many financial incentives that are in place in the system that have caused a spiraling out of control number of pills to land in all of our states. That has to end. And the only way that we're going to bring that to an end is by working together between local law enforcement, state, and on the federal side to put systems in place that not only bring accountability to manufacturers, wholesalers, pharmacies, physicians, anyone who violates the law, but we have to change the underlying policies that have actually led us to this point. We know that government has been an important part of the failure over the past 15 or 20 years. That has to come to an end. I was pleased to work with 37 state attorneys general when we started to go into the root causes of some of the improper financial incentives that ensures that products Opiate products are prescribed, I think, at a much higher rate than what anyone would like. We need to promote non-opiate alternatives, and we need to make sure we get this pill crisis under control because, as Attorney General Sessions and others have indicated, pills remain the principal pathway to heroin, to fentanyl, car fentanyl, elephant tranquilizer, these powerful products that steal generations of lives. In West Virginia, we created the first ever substance abuse fighting unit, and we've been working to try to attack this problem, educating kids in the schools, working within the community, building strong community networks in an effort to try to change people's heads and people's hearts. But make no mistake about it, we also need treatment. And I'm hopeful that through a lot of the enforcement work, that's going to occur collaboratively with states and the federal government, there will be those resources to ensure that another generation isn't lost to this terrible tragedy. I'm pleased to be here today, and I know we have a lot we're going to be working on with you and other state attorneys general over the upcoming months and years ahead. Thank you very much. It's uh, now my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Attorney General Brad Schimmel of Wisconsin. Well, good afternoon. I, too, would like to thank Attorney General Sessions and President Trump for their commitment to working at this truly nationwide problem. All the things that have been said by my predecessors that have been or my colleagues that have been before me today could be said about Wisconsin, too. Number one cause of accidental death, the pathway from prescription painkillers to heroin and then fentanyl in our states. Just last night, a few miles from my home in Wisconsin, two sheriff's deputies had to be administered Narcan to revive them from an inadvertent overdose while they were searching an automobile during a traffic stop. This is happening and it's, it's the impacts are spreading into so many areas of our lives. The concern is everywhere. In past, we have approached drug problems with a supply side attitude. We go after the supply side and then we don't address the demand side and the problem doesn't go away. It shifts the sources of the drugs. They change to a different drug, but we don't resolve the problem. I'm proud that nationwide, state attorneys general are working collaboratively and along with the federal government to address not just the supply side, but the demand side. And 
like the other states have talked about, we're arresting many drug dealers. Um, in the last year, we've had great cooperation with the federal government. Local, state, and federal authorities in Wisconsin have removed many pounds of heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine, fentanyl from our streets, recovered millions of dollars in drug profits, and locked up many dozens of high-level drug traffickers. We're breaking up these networks, but they'll keep refilling unless we focus on prevention and treatment, which we are now as a nation. And um, I'm, I'm proud of the work that we're all doing collectively. We recognize that this is a bipartisan issue and that everyone's in this together. So thank you very much. And it's my privilege to introduce my colleague from the great state of Texas, Attorney General Ken Paxton. Well, thank you all for being here today. I would hazard a guess that almost everybody in this room has been affected by this crisis, either with your own family or with a friend. And I can tell you, I come here speaking from personal experience. I've had family members that have been affected by this. And I so wish these efforts had come sooner because I see the devastation in my own family, the uh, seeing somebody young, uh, having their lives so affected, ending up homeless at times and, and struggling. It would have been so much better had we affected this crisis so much sooner. And if you haven't had a family member, you might be like me, where you've had friends affected by this. And, and to see the anguish in the face of a mother who's lost her son, her 23-year-old son, and face her and not know what to say to her, and wonder why we haven't dealt with this sooner, it's very difficult. And as she lives through her days and, and lives through holidays without her son, without her 23-year-old son, without getting to experience another birthday, I've become even more grateful that this group of people is here today to do something about it. And I hope that you all will spread the word. And I want to thank this administration, General Sessions and, and the Trump administration. I want to thank my colleagues because this is truly in a time where it seems like we have so much difficulty agreeing on issues, whether here in Washington or in our own states. This is an issue that we can all get behind and care about because we all know that this matters that we can save lives and that we have to save lives because I shouldn't have to tell another story like this, nor should any of you. So thank you all for being here. And let me take this opportunity to introduce uh, my colleague uh, from the great state of Arkansas, the Attorney General, uh, General Rutledge from Arkansas. Thank you. Good afternoon. Attorney General Sessions, thank you for your leadership, sir. Thank you to the president's leadership in addressing this issue. From early on in his administration, uh, the president tackled this from the forefront, uh, naming this opioid epidemic a public health emergency. And that's exactly what it is and exactly why we're here today. This is a multifaceted problem. It's gonna take multifaceted solutions to solve it. There is unfortunately no silver bullet that we can fire at this problem to stop it. It's gonna take education, treatment, and enforcement. All of those things working together. As you've already heard today, but let me reiterate, the opioid epidemic, it hits every single family, every single community across our state and across our nation. It doesn't care if you are black, white, Hispanic, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, what neighborhood you live in, this epidemic hits every single family and every single community. Too often, we have all met with family members who've lost loved ones, just as you've heard. But I think what we must address now, what we're talking about, is the face of the drug dealer. The face of the drug dealer has changed. What we used to envision as a questionable character, perhaps being in a van down by the river, is now a 75, 80-year-old grandmother leaving her medications out on that kitchen counter for a teenage grandchild to get into. And maybe it's that granddaughter that tore her ACL during a soccer game who's been prescribed 30 prescription pain meds and has taken them to school. So the face of the drug dealer has changed and we must address that. Address it through education like the Prescription for Life program I launched in Arkansas, through prescription drug take back to get people to clean out those medicine cabinets from their own homes, clean out those counters, and also through treatment of those with addictions and enforcement, just like what we're talking about today in this federal and state partnership. It's going to take every single one of us working together to curb and to stop this epidemic that is literally 
killing our families and friends. It is an honor to be here today to be working side by side the Department of Justice and President Trump's administration to address the opioid epidemic. It's now my honor to bring up Attorney General Sean Reyes from the state of Utah. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, General Sessions, to you and your team for your leadership. We appreciate that greatly, as well as for the leadership of the Trump administration, Kellyanne Conway, and their whole team. You know, because I wasn't introduced officially at the beginning, they told me I have an extra two minutes to, uh, to speak right now. Um, and I can say this. I know that every single one of my state AG colleagues could stand up here and tell stories similar to the ones that you've heard um, it's an issue that's so important to all of us. But being the last in line of uh, five or six state AGs uh, reminds me of the old adage, uh, everything important's been said, but not everyone important has said it. And so I don't know if I'm important, but I know the voice of Utah is important. I wanted to share with you some of the things that we've done. I was asked specifically to talk about state-federal partnerships and how they can work well together. No, um, like everywhere else in the nation, far too many Utahns are dying every single day from opioids. And like everywhere else in the nation, it is, a, uh, it is not a, a partisan issue. It's not a Republican or Democrat issue. It's a, it's a humanitarian um, and, and people issue. Um, as has been said, uh, it affects everyone of any, every background, race, age, uh, gender orientation. And so in Utah, we have worked um, extremely well together with our partners um, at the county, city, and uh, particularly the federal level. Uh, I, I have the privilege of co-chairing the Utah Opioid Task Force along with the greatest district agent in charge of the Drug Enforcement Administration, Agent Brian Besser. Never, never worked with a better federal partner. He co-chairs that with me, and in a short uh, two years, we have been able to further so many of the initiatives, uh, many of which are similar to those um, that have been talked about. One of those is the DEA 360 program. Um, pleased to announce that recently Utah was selected as the first state to receive uh, such valuable resources from the Department of Justice and the DEA. Uh, many other cities have received that benefit before, but Utah, um, because we're approaching this holistically uh, from our entire state perspective, uh, was chosen. And the mission of the DEA 360 program is to layer on uh, resources on top of everything that many in our communities have been doing throughout the nation for years trying to address this issue. Um, that is concerted law enforcement uh, efforts together. Um, we support uh, many different law enforcement initiatives and uh, as was mentioned by General DeWine, particularly um, illegal fentanyl uh, tableting, um, that's something that is just becoming, uh, if you look at the, the, the profit margins from that, with a few thousand dollars of investment in fentanyl, you can sell that for tens of millions of dollars illicitly. Um, and so we continue to work closely with our partners uh, at the federal level on that. Education, the DEA uh, film, Chasing the Dragon, has been a wonderful um, educational tool for us, as well as a film by Utah filmmaker Jenny McKenzie called Dying in Vain that I would commend to all of you, a Sundance film. And we've used that to educate faith leaders, educators, and people of every different background in rural communities and urban communities. Um, and that has been a tremendous effort. Um, and then finally, diversion, working with everyone uh, from wholesalers, pharmacies, prescribers, um, rehabilitation community uh, to try to make sure that we get uh, the needed resources to those who are afflicted, those who are suffering uh, from, from this threat. A uh, couple of points that I wanted to highlight, successes, uh, working together as uh, federal and state uh, agencies. Uh, we increased our drug take back program by 364 uh, percent under Agent Besser's uh, tenure over the last two years. Um, so just in this last year, I think it was about 33,671 pounds of, of, of drugs dropped off at, at our drop-off sites and points. And then briefly, let me highlight two other things that we've been able to work together in addition to all of the bills that we've passed and legislation that's currently being debated and many other outreach programs getting the lock zone uh, uh, available through law enforcement and through businesses and the private sector. These two things are one, a safe UT app, which uh, um, parenthetically has helped us intercept since, since 2016 
uh, 86 different uh, threats at uh, school violence. And so this app is a tool free for everyone in Utah to download to be able to report, particularly for our youth in school and students, um, incidents of violence at school or threats. But also, and this is the magic of this app, and we've had tens of thousands of interactions with young people who may be suffering or may be dealing with depression, they may be cutting themselves, they may be victims of abuse, uh, of human trafficking, but also they may be in, uh, in the, the grip of addictions. And because of this app, our numbers for teen suicide, which have skyrocketed for years, have finally uh, plateaued and, and even come down. And also we have been able to uh, intercede in a number of cases of addictions, getting resources to students and youth throughout our state. 24-7, uh, the, the, uh, the app is manned by uh, therapists from the wonderful University of Utah Neuropsychiatric Institute who will stay online with young people or anyone who again are, are dealing with and many people uh, are in the dealing with the darkness of addiction um, and they will stay with them until they can get them into a position of, uh, of feeling like there is some hope and there are resources. The other thing that I wanted to mention briefly uh, working through the state opioid task force has been passing a bill to create a, 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 a three-digit number similar to 911, whereas we all know 911 for physical emergencies, 311, or we're using a, a, a different number, will have the ability to let Utahns uh, for behavioral, mental health, addiction issues get immediate attention and help. And I know Senator Hatch is working on a bill from our state, Representative Chris Stewart, as well on the House side, to have a national three-digit number to allow us to be able to have, just like 911 is ubiquitous, uh, a three-digit number for people who, again, are, are dealing with addiction issues or other behavioral mental health um, challenges. And so I just wanted to, again, emphasize that, like in these other states that you've heard from, when we work together, uh, we work best. And there is some hope, as devastating as this issue is, we uh, have the ability, if we will work together in a bipartisan, nonpartisan way at federal, state, city, and county um, levels uh, with people coming together of, of all different backgrounds, uh, to be able to overcome and, uh, and, and one day eradicate uh, this threat from our community. So again, thank you, General Sessions. Um, at this point, uh, I'll introduce Sarah, who I think has some instructions for the Media Corps. memo from the House Intelligence Committee earlier this month and now the Democrats version available over the weekend. A lot of Americans are asking if this is business as usual at the FISA court. Will your department investigate and if the evidence is there hold FBI and Justice Department officials in contempt? We believe the Department of Justice must adhere to the high standards in the FISA court um, and yes it will be investigated. Um, and I think that's just the appropriate thing. The Inspector General will, will uh, take that as one of the matters uh, he'll deal with. Sir, yes, Attorney General, can you explain how this task force is going to um, hold manufacturers and distributors accountable in a way that the Justice Department hasn't been able to up to this point? Is it partly because of the law that Congress passed that restricted the ability of the DEA to hold them accountable? Can you we don't think that law will um, hamper us in any significant way. Uh, states have stepped forward uh, very aggressively. Uh, we are state filing a statement of interest, expect to, that will uh, be supportive uh, of uh, much of what they intend to do. We will also look to see what other civil actions that we can undertake in the department. Uh, we have three ways that work. One is criminal prosecution. Sometimes they're pharmacies or doctors or dentists actually committing criminal acts. And well, they're being indicted now and, and the reports are frequent of that happening. Uh, DEA can uh, pull on uh, uh, 
professional's license if they're not complying. And we can file a lawsuit here uh, to uh, pull license of any physicians or groups of pharmacies who are, that are violating the law and uh, impact their licensing in that way. And we could also uh, potentially file lawsuits for damages. Um, uh, uh, Attorney General Sessions, you mentioned in your remarks the importance of showing respect for law enforcement, 85% of local uh, uh, of enforcement that is done at the local level. Can you tell us whether you agree with uh, President Trump in his characterization of the deputy who stayed outside the Parkland shooting uh, as a coward, and do you think that's appropriate language to use about someone in those circumstances? I don't have any comment on that. I haven't examined that matter in detail, and would prefer not to comment. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, two questions uh, about this. The first is your statement of interest says it's focused on seeking reimbursement, but that's, does this also signal um, a promise from the Justice Department for full transparency when it comes from data from the DEA, which is I'm sure you know, um, is it sort of a sticking point in discovery? Uh, the other question is for really anyone on the stage, you know, some, some victims of the, the opioid epidemic have said to me they're not uh, terribly hopeful about this litigation. They see it mostly as a feeding frenzy for plaintiff's attorneys. You know, many counties have already contracted to firms to give them 30%. Is there any effort to cap the amount of money that will go to plaintiff's attorneys? That was a lot of questions on that. Um, <laughs> And how much yeah, money will on the DEA data, we are looking at that very hard. I've instructed our attorneys uh, in the last several days, actually, to make sure whatever we can produce for them, we know we can produce, let's do it now. And if there are areas that de need additional research before it's revealed, uh, we should do that. We can get busy about it. This is and can impact people's private medical records which are prohibited by law from being um, provided in inappropriate ways. So uh, we've got to comply with the laws, but we're going to be as cooperative as we can. And uh, so I don't know about the legal fees. States have made their own decisions about that, I suppose. If they've contracted already, they have not consulted with us. Uh, any litigation we undertake will be by Department of Attorneys. All right, last question, Mr. Chairman. Oh, yeah, hi, uh, Attorney General Sessions. You spoke earlier this morning um, at the conference with State Attorneys General about uh, banning bump stocks, but there's been talk of other possible solutions uh, for, to deal with gun violence recently, arming teachers, raising the age at which you can buy uh, a firearm. Uh, do you support one or more of those proposals, uh, and what, what would you like to see going forward? Well, we would like to see um, a far more effective way to deal uh, with a number of critical issues. One from my experience uh, that I think is important is to identify at an early stage uh, this problem of mental illness and potential for violence. Maybe the we have the law. It was uh, orig uh, originally declared by Judge Frank Johnson from Alabama, a great <laughs> civil libertarian judge and civil rights judge, but he said before you can detain somebody and uh, put them in custody, they either have to be a danger to themselves or to someone else. Uh, we, I think sometimes law enforcement has not even gotten up to that line. We need to be sure that when we have dangerous people that our deputies and our, our police officials and our district attorneys and our U.S. attorneys general, that they can know what their rights are and not to maybe pass too lightly away from these cases. As to the legislation and the president's position, I know he'll speak about that himself. Uh, we have one question. I could ask you one. Maybe see if it will allow. And the violation of my last question. And, uh, <laughs> okay, you've got uh, a great attorney's general and you could inquire of too, but. General Morrissey, one question for you. Uh, there's obviously this situation going on in your state with the teachers and the strike. Are you seriously considering a, a lawsuit to resolve this? And what is your message to those teachers that are striking? Well, I think that we've talked about this uh, back home in West Virginia, that uh, it is unlawful uh, to have a work stoppage. And I know that the governor and the legislature are trying to work through a number of issues right now. The way the system works in West Virginia, the Attorney General awaits authorization from the relevant state agency before he can pursue that legal action, and that is in process right now, so we'll await the State Board of Education meeting tonight. You're open, You're open to a lawsuit. 
uh, I believe that this is an unlawful action and we need to enforce the laws of our state. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.